So we were able to cover a lot last week. We went through all seven churches, and obviously I could have done a different uh, sermon on each church, but uh, kind of wanting to get through this, because this whole thing is supposed to be about end times prophecy. I showed last week that the churches, I believe, were seven churches that were literally there. And yes, we could glean some stuff from them. We can make some application for our own self. But, uh, but as far as this series goes, we want to deal primarily with the prophetic stuff. So in uh, chapter 1, they, Jesus said, Write the things that you see uh, and the things that are and the things which are to come. And here we see now he's, he's, he's in a new stage. I mean, he went up to heaven in the Spirit. I'll we'll talk about that in a second. And then it said, Come up hither, I will show thee things which must be hereafter. So, so the things that he's about ready to tell are about future events. But the whole scenario changes. And you're reading this, and you see all of a sudden he's up in, in heaven. One of the few people that have had the privilege of being able to see a glimpse of heaven. Now, all sorts of people today claim that they've seen heaven. There's a book written about it, I guess. Uh, I don't remember the name of it, but some book was real popular for a while where some little boy had the testimony that he had died and went to heaven and then he came back and, and all that. And uh, from what I understand, years later it came out and he said, ah, oh, that was just a lie. <laughs> I just made it all up. And uh, obviously a lot of prophetic type in the charismatic community, you know, say that I saw this and they start describing all these different things. And, uh, and I want to talk about some of those here in a minute, but, but in the Bible we see, obviously, it records experiences where certain individuals actually saw a glimpse of heaven. Okay, in the Old Testament, we would see this in, uh, in a little bit in Isaiah 6. Uh, you don't have to turn there now because we'll go to some of these uh, verses here throughout the message, but then also Ezekiel. I'm going to spend a little bit of time with uh, talking about Ezekiel's vision. When you get to the uh, New Testament, look at Acts 7. Acts 7, you see uh, just a really quick glimpse Stephen had right before he died, uh, but he's able to share just a tiny bit of what he saw. Acts chapter 7, verse 55 says, But he being full of the Holy Ghost, looking up steadfastly into heaven, and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand, of God, And he said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Notice there he talks about the heavens being opened. And uh, I'll come back to that in a minute. The Apostle Paul, maybe, he talks about a guy that saw the third heaven. Many say that he probably is talking about himself there. It certainly makes sense in the context. But look at 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. It is not expedient for me, doubtless to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago. Whether in the body I cannot tell or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. Such an one caught up to the third heaven. Everybody here probably understands. Don't get confused on the third heaven. Like uh, I think it's the Mormons that teach some kind of different types of heaven or something like that. Uh, I think the Bible is pretty clear that there are three different heavens that's mentioned all throughout the Bible. And that is when you look up in the sky, see the firmament, that's heaven. You know, what's beyond that with the stars and all that is heaven. And then the place where God lives would be called the third heaven. I think that most people are in agreement on that. But, um, uh, but he says, I, I know a man, and many think he's talking about himself, kind of being humble about it. I know a man caught up into the third heaven. And, uh, and he says, hey, you know, whether in the body or out of the body, I can't tell how that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. Of such a one, I will, uh, will I glory yet of myself? I will not glory, but in my infirmities. And then he begins to talk about the thorn, uh, the thorn in the flesh and all that. But he doesn't even give any details about what was seen there. He just says, there was, I know somebody who was caught up into the third heaven. And then obviously John gets to see uh, the revelation of Jesus Christ, gets a glimpse of heaven. And I'm sure we could pick some other guys out, but that was just something that I wrote down here. But like I said, many today will say, oh, I saw heaven. 
In fact, there's a story that I'm told about whenever I was a little kid. I was too, too young to know, uh, to remember this, but, I, but apparently I told my parents, oh, I saw Jesus before. They said, really? Yeah, he had his hat on backwards. <laughs> This is how the story was told to me, and so there's been all kind of speculation about what I saw or what I said. Some people say, you know, oh man, yeah, I was on the operating table, and I started to leave my body, and I was going towards the light. You've heard these kinds of stories, right? And, you know, there's bright lights on the operating table, so it's possible they just saw a bright light. Many people say different things. Some people find out later they just totally made up a lie. Some people, you know, just trying to sell books or, or do whatever, but, but here's the thing. We have records in the Bible of people who saw heaven, right? Really, this could apply to so many things, but if this is the testimony where we get our final authority, and we believe what is in here is the truth, it's the Word of God, this is what God wanted us to know, then even if somebody came and said, hey, no, seriously, I saw a vision, or no, seriously, God gave me some, some revelation, or God allowed me to speak in tongues, or God's... No matter what it is that they say, I'm either going to say, does it match up with the Bible? And if it doesn't match up with the Bible, I'm going to say, I don't believe them, because I believe the Bible more than them. Or if it matches up with the Bible, why did I need that? That's not going to change my faith any. <laughs> I'm going to believe the Bible if they had that experience or they didn't have that experience. So I personally don't see any reason why God would allow those things to happen right now. However, I'm not going to say nobody has ever had some kind of a dream or leading of the Lord or something like that. That's just not my place to, to say. But as far as most of these claims that someone saw God or saw a vision or got to go up to heaven, look, it doesn't really matter what they say because we can look at the Bible and say, Amen. there are some records in the Bible where people saw a glimpse of heaven. Now, when we look at what they saw, we're going to say, that's weird. Nobody would make that up. <laughs> But what's interesting is all throughout the Bible, they match up. <laughs> These testimonies match up. And so I'm going to go with the Bible, and I'm going to say there's some strange stuff that these people saw that they could hardly explain. They could hardly put into words. But we're going to go off the best that we can, what they did reveal, and we're going to say, well, the Bible is consistent on that, and it's very accurate about what they saw. So before any of the revelation... Uh, that we're going to get into about end times prophecy starts to unfold. I want to just talk about the fact that John went up into heaven and saw a glimpse of heaven. Now, there's a lot of stuff in the book of Revelation that I, I have a hard time taking literal. You know, it's like you should always try to assume that everything in the Bible is literal unless it kind of forces the matter that th this must be symbolic or something. But most things in in uh, Revelation, surprisingly, I think we can take pretty literal and, uh, and just go with that. And if there's something that, you know, hey, there's a sword coming out of Jesus' mouth or his eyes are like f flames of fire or something, and we don't know what that means exactly, well, that's fine, but this is what was recorded for us to know. And so I'm going to kind of take a pretty literal view about the things that he's seeing in, uh, in heaven. But let's read that little part there again, or let's just go to Matthew, I mean, uh, Revelation chapter 4. And we're going to be going through that. You might want to mark your place in Ezekiel as well. We'll go back between 1 and, uh, and 10. And a long time ago in uh, Iola, I did a, we, we went through the book of Ezekiel. And uh, when, I, when I was going through Ezekiel 1, and I had in mind that he's going to repeat some of this stuff in Ezekiel 10, and I realized a lot of that matched up, and I said, wow, that matches up a lot with Revelation. So I did a little study, and there's actually a link to this on, the, on our website, but uh, I've got Ezekiel 1, Ezekiel 10, and Revelation 1 all like compared to each other, and it just kind of goes around and breaks down the different elements of what he saw. And in doing that study, I don't want you to, I don't want you to take my word for it. We're going to go to the Bible, and, and, sh and I'm going to show you all these things, okay, because... Uh, I kind of don't like when guys just spend all their time talking about their thoughts and their ideas, and then it's like, oh, yeah, maybe I can find some scriptures to back that up or whatever. But just take my word for it. When I studied in Ezekiel, just take my word for it for now, and then I'll show you in the Bible. When I studied from Ezekiel, I just racked my brain trying to figure out what this vision was that Ezekiel saw. 
And you heard about the wheel within the wheel and uh, the different uh, cherubims and stuff like that. And I'm just going to show you the best that I can, taking a pretty literal uh, approach to uh, the Bible and these visions of heaven. And I'm going to just show you, I'm just going to scribble some things out here real quick, and then we'll talk through these different elements. So uh, I'm going to I'm gonna try to explain this as I go, and I uh, haven't really planned this out, so <laughs> I don't know how this will work. There's some sort of a firmament here, okay? And I believe I'm going to show that, uh, that the, this is also what's referred to as a sea of glass sometimes, something like that. Also uh, referred to as, uh, I can't think of the other word, but word right now. But there seems to be some kind of a platform, okay, that comes up in this vision. I'll show you these in a minute, all right? On that firmament or whatever, there's a throne. All right. And there's somebody sitting on the throne. I'm not trying to enter any contests or anything, so <laughs> bear with me. All right. There seems to be some kind of a bow, a rainbow in this, in uh, surrounding this. Now, this is just comparing different, uh, different visions in here, okay? Now, here is a part that's very, very strange. <laughs> this is the cherubim, okay, or seraphim. I'm going to explain my, my thought on this in a minute, but I'll show you from the Bible. Uh, I think they're the same thing, okay? And in Ezekiel's vision, there's going to be four of them, okay? And each of them have their wings spread out. All right, let's try something like this. And you're probably aware of this, but they have four faces, which is really strange. Okay, and they've got their wings spread out like that. And then they've got wings covering their body. They've got uh, their feet are like somehow compared to like a cattle's feet. And uh, they've got their hands of men are shown underneath their wings or something along those lines. Those aren't udders. <laughs> those are hands, okay? <laughs> All right. It appears like I didn't do this out very good, so let's give them some longer wings here. Uh, it appears like maybe these two are touching each other. All right, one. Oh, that's pretty bad. All right, something like that. I don't know. Four heads, two wings covering the body, hands, feet. Okay, and then there's, there's four of these. You got another one over here. You got another. Okay. Obviously, this is very loose. I don't know what this looks like, but in the center of this, there is some sort of whirlwind or a fire enfolding itself within itself. And then, if that's not strange enough, you can see why some of these guys start saying, oh, there's aliens out there, and, and uh, this is a, a UFO that came down. And, and so then there are a wheel within a wheel, which most people think that means there's a wheel, and then a wheel inside that, which would be like a, what's that thing called? Huh? Styroscope? Is that, I can't hear you saying. Gyroscope. Yeah, yeah. Gyroscope. And, uh, and in there, it explains like fire and stuff like that. And each one of the wheels within the wheel. Okay? And uh, so there's all smoke, there's lightning, all that kind of stuff going on here. It says that these have the spirit of God. Or, or no, these are the spirit of the angels, okay? And whenever it, uh, whenever it goes anywhere, it doesn't, like, turn. It goes, I mean, the Bible describes all this. It's really strange, but it describes all this. It goes, and, like, everybody's just, all these angels, like, they don't move. Well, it makes sense if you think about it, because they got four faces, right? So, like, this is the front, this is the front, <laughs> this is the front. And if they want to go that way, the whole thing goes that way. If they want to go that way, the whole thing goes that way. This is the way the Bible describes it. 
Now, the interesting thing about these faces is one is the face of a man and probably a, a young man is what I'm thinking based on the, uh, uh, the, uh, the different accounts. And so you got, oh man, this is going to be difficult. So you got just a man here. Is that holding it upside down? He's an ugly man. All right, you got a man, and I don't remember the exact order, so I'll probably get this wrong. But you got a man, you've got a lion. Wow, that does not look like a lion. It looks like an elephant. <laughs> There's a lion. There's an ox over here, so I'll just get two horns represent the ox. And then on the other side, there is an eagle, all right? Now, I'll try to make reference when we go back and forth between Revelation and Ezekiel to some of these features, okay? But that is a strange creature. <laughs> this is a strange image. But the fact that it matches up so much all throughout Scripture makes you think, this is something really going on in heaven, all right? And you can understand where it talks about God riding chariots, you know, that must be it. A chariot of fire coming down and swooping up Elijah or whatever. You know, a lot of this stuff is very consistent. <laughs> and so let's look at Revelation chapter 4. And I'm just going to break down the different points like this. Number one, we see an open door. Remember Stephen when he said he saw the heavens open, right? This was, uh, uh, for some reason, when they see this vision, there's an opening in the sky, whether, you know, obviously it's a vision, but it's, it seems to be what would really happen if God was coming down. Ezekiel, when he saw that, it was a vision, but I think it was really going on, and God was, was making himself seen to him somehow. And so uh, four, chapter 4, verse 1 says, After this I looked, and behold, a door was open in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was as it were a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither. And I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the spirit and behold, a throne was set in heaven. OK, so the first thing we had was a door was open. I mentioned uh, Stephen. Hold your place real quick and go back to uh, in hold, hold your place in Revelation. Go back to Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter one. And verse twenty six. And above the firmament that was over their heads was the likeness of a throne as the appearance of a sapphire stone. And upon the likeness of the throne was a likeness as of the appearance of a man above, uh, above upon it. All right. So you got this firmament, whatever that is. Like, I'm, like I said, I might have not drawn it so well because uh, I don't know exactly what he saw. But there's something up there. And on that is this throne throne with a man sitting on it. And there's all these different stones that are mentioned, sapphire, uh, jasper, I mean, all these different things. And then there's also times where it talks about a rainbow. And so I can't say exactly how that works, but there seems to be some, a lot of bright colors and a lot of like reflection going on. And if this is called a glass, it kind of makes you think there could be some kind of a prism kind of an idea uh, uh, going on there. I don't know. This is just That's just speculation, but I'm... I'm comparing these scriptures with one another. So, so first of all, there was an open door. And all these visions, you know, I could probably show a lot of other places. I did think about uh, in Genesis, I think, I can't remember where it was. I want to say like 28 or something like that. That's in my mind. But uh, where Jacob has a vision, uh, they call it Jacob's ladder. And the uh, ladders, uh, in his vision, the ladder goes up to heaven. He sees the heavens open and he sees... Uh, angels coming up and down from that ladder. And then he says, after he wakes up, he's like, surely this is the gate of heaven. <laughs> right? So just interesting. There's always this, this talk about like how the heavens open. Now, getting way out there, this is, this is just me. This isn't the Bible. But trying to think of how God exists in time, in our time and outside of our time, I've often thought it's almost like a dimensional type of a thing. Like, like they're stepping out of a different dimension into our time zone or something like that. I don't know if that's true. That's just my, my thinking. But 
Then there is not only the open door, but then they always see this firmament, whatever, with a throne of God on it, okay? And so Revelation 4 talked about that, and it said uh, there was a, there was a, the throne was set in heaven, one sat on the throne, and then it talks about uh, the, the one that sat on it. <clears throat> he that sat on it look, uh, was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. And uh, there was a rainbow round about the throne in the sight like unto an emerald. And so these are some different views that he has on this throne. Look at Ezekiel now. We'll be, like I said, we'll be going back and forth a whole lot. <clears throat> Ezekiel 1 in verse 26. And above the firmament that was over their heads was the likeness of a throne as the appearance of a sapphire stone. And upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness of the appearance of a man above it. And I saw as a cloud of amber as the appearance of fire round about within it from the appearance of his loins even downward and from the appearance of his loins even, uh, uh, I'm sorry, upward and then, uh, and then downward. I saw as it were the appearance of fire and it had brightness round about as the appearance of of the bow that is in the clouds in the day of rain, so was the appearance of the brightness round about. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell on my face, uh, and I heard the voice of one that spake. Interestingly enough, I didn't put this in my notes, but all, all the times that somebody has a vision of this, they fall on their face, or they're speechless and they can't talk. Now, you can look at my drawing, and you can look at me trying to explain this and say, well, that's pretty weird, but, you know, I think I would probably look at that and say, well, that's weird. No, when you see this, you fall on your face. You ever seen, like, have you ever been in a thunderstorm, and you're just seeing the lightning and hearing the thunder, and it scares you? I mean, <laughs> I don't care how old you are, how strong you are, you're like, I could die now. And I always think, like, one of the scariest places I could be is, like, in the middle of the ocean, in a boat, in the middle of a thunderstorm. <laughs> and you just feel like... You're, you're helpless. I mean, you know, God could just do with you to you whatever he wanted to. And I feel like that's kind of the feeling they get when they, uh, even way, way worse, you know, because uh, they sense the power of God and they fall down. There's always loud noises like a trumpet. There's always thunders and thundering and lightning. And God makes his presence known. Remember when he's uh, in the, <laughs> Moses goes up onto the mountain and you got this, this big uh, pillar of fire, you know, and you got these thunder thundering and, and lightning and, and all the people are like, I ain't going up there. <laughs> you could go up there and talk to God. We're staying down here because they're terrified of it. And so uh, this is pretty common throughout the Bible. Now look at um, Isaiah chapter six. We'll be coming. We'll be in all three of these places, but Isaiah chapter six, verse one. Our study is not in Isaiah, so I won't spend a lot of time on this. But in the year that Uzziah, uh, King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims, above, above that train, whatever it is. Now the drawings have him you know, with a long gar, uh, a robe with a tail on it that fills... They call that a train, but look, the Bible talks about people as being a train, or it talks about different things. Whatever this is that fills the temple, it's calling it his train, and above that train are the seraphims, okay? And uh, anyway, so he saw that throne. I'll come back to these other verses in a minute. He sees that throne just like uh, in these other visions, very consistent. All right, so the third thing, I already mentioned it briefly, lightnings and thunderings. All right, see the open door, see the throne of God, see the lightnings and the thunderings. Revelation 4, verse 5. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. I heard different speculation as to what it, that is. I don't think that's important here to, what, uh, the, the, to where I'm going with the sermon. And before the throne... There was a sea of glass like unto crystal, and in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. I got ahead of myself. But you see, he's mentioning this sea like crystal, and he's talking about these lightnings and these thunderings that are coming out. Look at uh, Ezekiel 1 again. 
While you're turning there, let me read Ezekiel 10 real fast. I forgot on the throne. He sees this vision again uh, in chapter 10. And he says, Then I looked, and behold, in the firmament that was above the head of the cherubims, there appeared over them, as it were, a sapphire stone, as the appearance of the likeness of a throne. Okay, so he gives that vision again in chapter 10. All right, back to Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 4. All right, remember the lightnings and the thunderings? Verse 4 says, And I looked, and behold, a whirlwind came out of the north, a great cloud and a fire enfolding itself, and a brightness was about it, and out of the midst thereof, as the color of amber out of the midst of a fire. And also of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures. I'll get to them in a minute. So he sees, before he sees the creatures or anything else, he sees this whirlwind that's coming. And he talks about this fire enfolding itself and all that. And so he's seeing this whirlwind. Now that makes me think about in 2 Kings 2 uh, and then uh, later on in that, twice in 2 Kings 2, he talks about the whirlwind that came and got Elijah. Okay, he goes up in, it says, a chariot of fire. And it also says, in a whirlwind. Now, I could just use my imagination a little bit and say, that fits. I mean, there's a whirlwind coming down. There's a chariot. You know, God's riding this chariot, and he comes down, and he gets him. That would seem to match 2 Kings as well. Okay, but then look at uh, Ezekiel. What did we just? We just read 1-4, right? And I look, okay, now look at verse uh, 13 and 14. As for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire and like the appearance of lamps. It went up and down among the living creatures and the fire was bright and out of the fire went forth lightning. And the living creatures ran and returned as the appearance of a flash of lightning. So uh, as I talked about how this, this text here talks about how the, whenever it moved, you know, they didn't have to turn or anything like that. It just went wherever. I'm trying to think of a, of a good way to describe that. But the whole mass just kind of went wherever. But also, it went like a flash of lightning. <laughs> you know, like in the twinkling of an eye, I guess. <laughs> you know, it, can just, it can just move here to there. All right. And so, uh, uh, so now we've, we've covered most of those. But we haven't actually got to... Well, let me talk about the sea of glass again. I already mentioned some of these. Revelation chapter 4, verse 6. And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal, and in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. Ezekiel 122. And the likeness of the firmament upon the heads of the living creature was as the color of the terrible crystal stretched forth over their heads above. So over their heads, this crystal-like uh, thing. Okay, uh, let me see here. Let's go to chapter 10, verse 1. I think we already read it, but... Then I looked, and behold, in the firmament that was above the head of the cherubims, there appeared, as it were, a sapphire stone as the appearance of the likeness of a throne. So over and over, we're seeing this consistently line up. You got the, 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 door, of, the door to heaven opened. He sees this glimpse coming of, of this... Uh, uh, this image coming down like a chariot coming down on it. There's this firmament. There's a throne of God on the firmament. There's lightnings, there's thunderings and, uh, and, uh, the lamps of fire and such. This sea of glass is an interesting thing, but then the really peculiar to me always been really peculiar are these beasts or these creatures. The Bible uses both words here. Okay. And these Often, pe often people have said, if you look up, hey, what is a cherubim? What's a seraphim? They're going to say it's a type of angel, and they're going to give a certain rank to these angels. This angel's higher than this angel. and I'll, I don't know where people got that. I don't find it in the Bible. I think somebody just kind of made this up, or there was a secondary source that they went to. I don't see in the Bible where there's ranks of angels, okay? In fact, I don't see anywhere in the Bible where it calls a cherubim an angel or a seraphim an angel. And so I'm trying not to use that. I might slip sometimes and say it on accident, but it's a it's a heavenly being that is that God created. Okay. Interestingly enough, Satan was among the cherub, right? He was a cherub. He was among the cherubim, and so 
whatever this class of being was, according to the Bible, I'm suspecting that was Lucifer, you know. And Lucifer got lifted up and thought he was something special and, and, uh, and lifted up with pride, and you know how that story goes. Okay, but this was what he was. Now, earlier I said something about, I think seraphim and cherubim are the same. And I'm going to just kind of briefly explain that as we compare these two. One says he has four wings, and that's the cherubim. The I-M at the end just makes it plural, okay? So the cherub, cherubim is plural. And then seraphim, it says they have six wings, okay? Now, I've heard people say that, well, if you study the etymology of those, you know, cherub has to do with four, and seraph has to do with seven. I can't see that. If you look it up, actually, as far as I could tell, just looking up the, the, uh, that word and the etymology of that word, it has to do with actually like fiery, like burning lamps. <laughs> right? So I don't know where they get uh, some of the things that they said about that. But these creatures are just these unexplained beings that have angels. I mean, uh, not, okay, I was getting ahead of myself. That have wings, okay? We talk about angels having wings. Nowhere in the Bible do angels ever have wings. However, these created beings, not called angels, but they have wings. Why some are called seraphim, some are called cherubim, I don't completely understand. But here's what I know. Let's compare Ezekiel 1 to Revelation, and let's look at these beings. Okay, so Revelation 4. God took the time to put these images in here, and I don't completely understand it, but it's, it, it builds my faith. To realize how consistent it is and how this is is a thing that actually exists in heaven <clears throat> revelation uh, chapter 4 verse 6 and before the throne there was a sea of glass like in a crystal in the midst of the throne and around about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind what are these eyes i don't know <laughs> but you know you just you would think that that just refers to the fact that they can it's like all seeing eyes they can see everything they're omnipotent but i don't really know i these could be literal eyeballs <laughs> that are in there or sometimes the word eye is used i believe if you go study the the uh, building of the te temple in the old testament i believe sometimes the word eye is used where there's just like this circular uh, uh protrusion whenever they're building something they just call them eyes. Maybe they're supposed to look like eyes or whatever. I don't know. So, so it could be that these just have these like these knots or spots all over them. I don't. I really don't know. Or they're or they're literal eyes. <laughs> but uh, but so I didn't draw that part. But all about these these beings are something that we're going to call eyes because that's what the Bible calls them. All right, and so they're all over. They're they're all over the wings, and I think inside the the creature. Okay, so uh, where was I? Revelation chapter four. What did I leave off on six? Okay, verse seven. And the first beast was like a lion, and the second beast like a calf, and the third beast had a face as a man. And the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about them, about him, and they were full of eyes within. And they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. Let's look at Ezekiel now. Ezekiel 1, verse 22. I'm sorry, Ezekiel 1, let's start with verse 5. All right, here we go. Also, out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures, and this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man, and everyone had four faces, and everyone had four wings, and their feet were straight feet, and the soles of their feet was like the sole of a calf's foot, and they sparkled like the color of of burnished brass and they had uh, the hands of a man under their wings on their four sides and they four had their faces and their wings their wings were joined one to another they turned not whether uh, when they went 
they went every one straight forward. As for the likeness of their faces, they had they they four had the face of a man, the face of a lion on the right side. They had the four uh, uh, they four had the face of an ox on the left side. They four had the face of an eagle. Sorry, I misread that a little bit. Thus were their faces, and their wings were stretched upward. Two wings of every one were joined one to another, and two covered their bodies. And they went every one straight forward, whether the Spirit was to go, they went, and they turned not when they went. As for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire, and like uh, the appearance of lamps. It went up and down among the uh, living creature, and the fire was bright, and out of the fire went forth lightnings. So I'm thinking like this, uh, this burning lamp appearance. Like, have you ever watched, uh, one of my favorite things to do is watch a burning fire at nighttime, and you're watching that thing kind of smolder, and, and, and you watch that wood. Have you ever seen how the, the different, the bright color of the burning wood and the, and the embers, and they just kind of, like, it, it moves around, <laughs> you know? That's kind of how I picture these. They're like, there's, there's this light that's just kind of moving within them, and then, of course, lightnings and stuff coming out of them. I know it sounds like a sci-fi movie, but where do you think, where do you think the sci-fi people got all this? <laughs> It's kind of like, you you know, people watch a movie. Oh, that's the greatest story ever told. And then somebody else comes out. I remember whenever uh, people were saying E.T. was like the story of Jesus Christ. And E.T. came down from heaven and he did this. And he ends up giving his life and all that. They said the same thing about Superman. And I'm like, no, what the thing is, maybe they had this in their mind. But the thing is, the best stories ever written are in the Bible. And you can't get any better than that. So you have to make a story that matches <laughs> the story of the Bible. All right. And so the same thing, sci-fi, where did they get some of this stuff? You know, they got, they got some of it from the Bible. Uh, or they looked at God, some of God's creatures. Like you, you magnify a bug's face, you know, enough times. And you'll be like, man, that looks like an alien. <laughs> you look at some of the sea creatures in the bottom of the sea. Boy, that looks like an alien. And so they, they just use their imagination. But... But look, no, nobody can create. People, man can't create something. I consider myself creative. I consider myself an artist. I like to create. But I can't create anything except for the influence that I have in my mind of stuff that I've already seen that God created. <laughs> so it's pretty amazing. And it shouldn't, we shouldn't really marvel whenever we see something in the Bible and say, hey, that sounds like something I saw. You look, Bible way is way more up to date than science and Hollywood and, <laughs> and anybody. Okay, so... But here are these creatures, and these creatures have these faces like I described, and I don't remember the right order. I don't think it's super important, but, the, you know, you got an eagle over here, you got an ox over here, man's face, and a uh, lion's face, okay? Now, I've heard this. I always like pointing this out because I think it's really cool, but I can't prove it from the Bible. But I've, always, I've heard people say that this likely represents the four Gospels. Have you heard that? So they'll say like the, uh, you know, you got Matthew and Matthew seems to be focused on the fact that Jesus is a king. And so they say, you know, the king of the forest, the lion, you know, he's powerful, represents the might. And then you got Luke. Luke represents him as more of a uh, of a servant. And so or no, let's see. Uh, that might be Mark. I can't remember. Uh, more like a servant and so you think about like the serving like the beast of burden you got the ox and then you got the uh, the son of man you know he comes as the man and and then you got uh, that's Luke you know that makes sense Luke was the physician and and uh, anyway you've heard probably this already but then John is a very different book and it's very spiritually minded it gets away from the physical so some people say the eagle represents like the uh, uh, the spirit part of of the gospel so you got matthew mark luke john four gospels that god gave us and uh and they say well how you know these faces represent that I, I, it's really cool and i like bringing it up because i think it's neat but it but it probably a stretch because i don't have any way of proving that in the bible okay but uh but certainly these are among the most powerful creatures on the earth okay and even if you think about it Historically, uh, you can look at Babylon or you can look at any of these places and anywhere they have these king kingdoms, a lot of times there's something guarding the doors of the kingdom. And a lot of times that has the face of a lion or the face of an eagle 
uh, mixed with the body of a calf or, you know, so, uh, all these kind of things. And the idea is that, hey, these are among the most powerful creatures that God's made, and this represents our kingdom or whatever. But, but this was the best that John could describe it, the best that Ezekiel could describe it, where we would understand it. But he described these, uh, these four different faces. Now, when you read Revelation, you say, wait, wait, but in Revelation, there are four individual beasts with, with one face. He had the face, this one, this angel had the face of a man, this angel had the face of a lion, this angel, right? Four beasts. Whereas in Ezekiel, all four of them have four faces, right? This is my thinking. I could be wrong. Maybe there's maybe they're different beings, but it's pretty neat that they're they always they're always existing whenever someone has a vision of God. But my thinking is this: maybe what John saw was uh, one face, you know, was was primary here, and he recognized that that face was, you know, a man. This one, if the man's facing outward, the man's face here is facing outward, over there it would be facing that way, so here he might see the eagle, right? And here he might see, do you understand what I'm saying? So he would see four creatures, he would see four different faces, but that doesn't necessarily mean they didn't each have all four faces. That's my theory, okay? What about the wings? This one said they had six wings, and Ezekiel said they had four wings. Now, I don't, I'm not adding or taking away from the Word of God. That, that could be just exactly what it is. But it could be that he saw four wings. And actually, we know from Isaiah, with twain, they did uh, cover their face. And twain, they did cover their, uh, their body. And with twain, they did fly. So let's say in... Uh, let's say in... I don't think I'm, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do that. I probably shouldn't erase that. <laughs> okay, so let's say you've got this creature, all right, and he's got four heads. One's, one's in the back. You can't see it, all right, and two of his wings, two of his wings, he's flying. My perspective is way off. Okay, and, uh, and two, he's covering himself. All right, and two, he's covering his face. These wings may be behind, you know, so you would have like a... You know, two wings, two wings, two wings. And uh, maybe that would be the case, I don't know. And, uh, and so if this is covering these faces, you would only see one face. Okay, but you wouldn't recognize that there are six wings and say, hey, yeah, that's a six-winged creature, right? But what if these wings in Ezekiel were in the back? They are down like this, and you couldn't see them. You would see four wings, and you would see all four faces. Just a theory. I don't know. And it doesn't, it's not super important if you say, well, no, I, I think you're wrong. I think this had four, and, uh, and, and they had six wings, and this one had, you know, four wings, but they only had one face. Uh, or other way around, I guess, four wings in Ezekiel. It doesn't really matter. But here's the point is that all these visions line up super, super closely. You know, Now, an interesting thing, and in the Bible, I love how it always gives multiple accounts of different stories, especially important things, like why are there four Gospels? You know, why, are there, uh, why do you have kings and then you have chronicles? You get to read it again. Why do you get the law in Exodus and then you get it again in Deuteronomy? Why do you get in Revelation, you know, the first half of Revelation, you get the story. Second half of Revelation, you get the story all over again. Well, because when we hear multiple stories told a slightly different way, we get more out of it, right? And it proves it to be more, more true. So if, if you had two witnesses, you know, they were testifying about a crime they saw, and their witnesses were exactly the same, you know, any experienced detective would say, I think these guys collaborated and they made this story up. But if they were really, really close, but they told slightly different things because they saw things a little bit differently from their perspective, then the person would say, this has got to be a true story. All right? And so the Bible provides that for us. They provides multiple accounts of the same stories and the same images that are slightly different, but you're saying, look, this is a real thing. <laughs> and it's not like, you know, Ezekiel didn't know John. John was many years later. <laughs> but it's not like John read Ezekiel's writings and said, I'm just going to copy that to a T. 
No, there are a lot of similarities, but what he saw in, in the way, the angle that he presents it is enough different that you're like, whoa, these are two different accounts, two different eyewitnesses. And this is the way God used about 40 authors of the, of the Bible and gave them all these revelations and gave them these prophecies and all this stuff. And then they wrote it down. We get to read it all, man. We get to take it all in and, uh, and understand it in a greater way than anybody ever has. So anyway, this is what chapter 4 of Revelation shows us. There's a sky that the uh, heavens open. He sees this throne of God, lightnings, thunderings, lamp, uh, a fire. He sees a sea of glass. He sees a, a cherubim and, or, or seraphim or whatever. And, uh, and look, if you want a glimpse of heaven, I know I've always wanted to know what heaven looks like. I've always wanted to see it. If you want to know what does heaven look like, what's a glimpse of heaven? And what does the glorified Jesus look like? You know? Well, here's what you can do. You don't have to read someone else's dreams. You don't have to investigate somebody else's account or, or buy the latest bestseller, you know, that uh, somebody wrote that's going to tell you about what they saw when they went to heaven. You just pick this Bible up and you start reading and you say, wow. Heaven's an interesting place. <laughs> God's throne and the temple and all that, that's some interesting stuff. And uh, you don't need Hollywood. You don't need dreams. You don't need Brother Rocky's uh, drawings and illustrations. Uh, all you need to do is take up the Bible. And, uh, you know, we, we can't really compute all of it in our minds, obviously. I did the best that I could to prevent, present these ideas based on what I've seen and compared and tried to figure out. But each of us can read the Bible and see, you know, there's, there's an authority given here. And so John is about to see some major prophecies of things that are going to unfold. Isn't it, isn't it interesting that they're the exact same things that Jesus said were going to unfold? Exact same things that Daniel said were going to unfold. Why? God gave each of these people these visions. All right. And so John is, is pretty much confirming or proving. I mean, we believe the whole word of God, but he's confirming that everything he's about to say is exactly like it is. And we can always trust the word of God and believe that testimony. And we need to. It's a more sure word of prophecy. We need to trust it more than man's word for sure. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for... Some of the mysterious things in your word, you've made them clear to us, as clear as you can. And we believe them and we know that they're going to happen and we know they exist. But we and our human minds can't fathom some of these things. But Lord, I pray that you'll just help us uh, to just have faith in your, your word and uh, to believe it, keep studying it, reading it, and let it speak to us in a way that only the Holy Spirit can. And I pray, Lord, that you'll help us to uh, be convicted in our hearts about the reality of heaven and the reality of hell and the reality of the gospel. And we would go out and preach that and make that a priority in our lives uh, to, by which we, we uh, are, uh, revolve our entire life, Lord. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.